Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. You guys, I'm so excited. I have a rock star of a fertility doctor on, Dr. John Jane. Hi, John. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, Dr. Amy. Good to be here. <laughs> I'm not Dr. Amy, John. I'm Amy to you. No, I'm just kidding. Dr. Amy to everyone else. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm Amy. I'm Amy to whoever wants to call me Amy. Uh, well, we're going to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, especially as a woman who's in her 40s, and that's fertility and pregnancy over 40. And of course, there's no better person to talk about this than you because you run one of the most successful egg donor. And I know guys, when I say egg donor 40, don't feel like I'm giving up on you, but egg donor banks, not just a bank, but also agency in terms of running egg donors through fresh cycles. One of the best that I have ever seen in my entire life in the entire world. So I applaud you. So thank you, John. I just had to start off by saying that. Thank you. Well, we've, uh, we've had some great success together, you and I, Amy. So it has. It's been really special for me to be able to refer patients to you because I, I know they're going to be in really good hands when, when they see you. So just talk to, talk a little bit about yourself here. Well, I'll talk about you, actually. So you're a board-certified reproductive endocrinologist and a pioneer in the field with at least 20 years of academic experience. Well, 20 years of ex- at least 20 years of experience and a lot of that academic, including a decade, a, a, a decade as a decorated professor of OBGYN at USC School of Medicine. And at USC, you also spearheaded egg freezing research and subsequently created the university's egg freezing program. And that's one of the things you're very famous for, certainly. And you now bring that expertise to Santa Monica Fertility and you're dedicated to advancements in the area of cryopreservation through cutting head cutting edge research as well. So welcome to the show, but I'm super curious. Why did you decide to go into fertility? Yeah, <laughs> great field, isn't it? We, uh, both you and I made the right move, I think. Um, um, you know, back when I was in residency in the early 90s, uh, uh, I felt like a kid in a candy store, you know, it's such a great field. There's OB, there's high-risk OB, there's gynecology and all the women's health fields. And then there was reproductive endocrinology, and it was innovative and exciting and technologically cool. Um, I actually just saw uh, it sort of blossoming into a real remarkable science and being able to help build families. And I was really interested in how, um, as professionals, we would be we'll be able to um, um, improve childhood health through embryos, you know. And look, look, thirty years later, it's kind of coming true. We're, we can do a lot more and uh, help. Uh, parents help patients become parents, build families, and all the cool um, in vitro stuff in molecular genetics. I think it's still a phenomenal and wonderful field to be in. But that's that's how I picked it, and I'm glad I did. Yeah, it's really fun. I mean, it obviously comes with its challenges, of course. But I agree. I agree with you. Thank you for sharing that. And tell us about Santa Monica Fertility. I mean, tell us about what made you start San- your own practice. Well, you know, you alluded to the fact that I was at USC for quite some time. Um, you know, we don't really hit our stride, right, till we leave fellowship and get out and practice. So I spent some extra time in academics. I'm, I'm really happy I did. Uh, and when I was there, I did I did a lot of work on egg freezing, which was very novel at the time in the early 2000s. Um, did one of the first clinical trials actually in the world and had babies. It was pretty exciting. And then I actually created the first donor egg bank in California uh, way back in the day, maybe before its time. Um, uh, and it was that, uh, egg freezing, uh, technology that, um, led me out of USC. So I built Santa Monica to do that, to offer egg freezing to women who want to freeze their own eggs and to pursue donor egg banking. Now we're talking almost 20 years ago. Um, so today, you know, we talk about egg freezing and women like, yeah, I want to freeze my eggs. It's sort of commonplace. Do you know that in 2009, I did the national debate at the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And my side was, Women should be allowed to freeze their eggs if they're if they're consented to do so. Well, that was contentious at the time. Um, you know, we we speed ahead. What, twelve, thirteen years later? Now it's commonplace because it does work and it's a great thing. Um, so you know, it's interesting. I, I came to Santa Monica Fertility. We froze eggs for women. And then I built the egg bank, and now we've metamorphosized into a third party reproduction center. So we focus on uh, 
of donor eggs, both fresh shared cycles, an egg bank, and surrogacy. And we put it all together with the medical care, uh, an integrated practice, you know, and patients find it less stressful and, you know, the success rates uh, speak for themselves. So it's a nice way to practice. And we get a lot of babies and that makes me really happy. Truly. And I get a lot of really positive feedback about the experience that patients have as well. So let's talk about, you know, fertility and chances for a woman who's 40. I mean, I see patients sometimes that are not sometimes a lot of the times that are over 40. And, you know, a lot of them don't know what the pregnancy rates are. I'll ask them a question. I'll say like, what do you think your chances are at 45? And they'll say 50%. And it's just so hard for me because I'm such an annoyingly positive person. It's hard for me to be like, well, actually it's more like slim to none. So, you know, in your own words, what do people need to know about fertility rates and natural conception when they're over 40? Yeah. Well, first of all, don't change your annoyingly positive way. It's a good thing, right? Um, you know, I think understanding fundamentals uh, is the best. If someone understands why someone's saying something is best. Uh, so for me, when I work with women um, 40 and older, I, I try to impart on them one simple fact, and that is egg quality, right? So it all um, starts with the egg. Eggs have 46 chromosomes. They have to get rid of 23 to make room for the sperm. If they don't get rid of 23, then the fertilized egg has a wrong number. It doesn't work. That's it. And that's pretty e easy for most people to get their head around. Um, the egg makes mistakes at all ages, but after 40, 90% of the eggs make the mistake. At 45, almost 100% make the mistake. Okay, what if I take this herb and this supplement and I cut out sugar and I cut this out and my eggs gonna get better? The answer is no, we can't change the eggs but we can get more of them. That's called IVF. Get more out of the body, maybe we can find a normal one. So I think I found when I, when I tell patients about that underlying factor that it's just nature. And at 40, it's better than 41, it's better than 42. By 43, 44, it's really getting pretty, pretty bad. Um, I think they get it. It doesn't mean they shouldn't try, but with that piece of information, and then understand that IVF is not magic. It just gets more eggs out of the body but it doesn't help the egg. I think those two pieces of information I found to be very useful to patients. Right, I mean, IVF is magic when it works. <laughs> a lot of times, I mean, I don't think people realize that most, if you look at live births across the board for all comers, most of the time it actually doesn't work. You know, if you take every single person that does IVF in this country every year, less than 50% will actually take home a baby. And that's really hard. But I think when you're over 40, if you were to choose between cycling yourself, depending on your situation versus an egg donor, obviously that will take you up closer to not a hundred percent, but a lot higher. What about men and women? Do men see that same rate of decline when they're over 40 as women? So the answer globally is no, right? That men can father children well into their forties, fifties, sixties, but here's what's missing. We don't know because all the research has been on women. And yes, the egg factor and the egg quality factor is a big deal, that's the driver. But I have found my own research um, that the semen analysis, you know, the sort of the gold standard of sperm does not tell us the whole picture. So you know, the, for, the, for, the, for the listeners, the semen analysis um, is a microscopic exam of the sperm looking at the count, um, the, the swimmers, it's called motility and the shape called morphology. And if it looks good, you're good to go. And most guys get a pass, right? But remember the sperm cell is like a delivery truck. It's bringing DNA, that's the package. And DNA gets into the egg and makes the embryo. And that's what matters. And things like advancing paternal age, change the DNA. Bad habits, you drink a lot, you smoke a lot, you're sedentary, you don't exercise and you don't take vitamins. You're gonna change the DNA. And yes, it will affect embryo outcome and maybe pregnancies. And so that's the piece of information that's lost. I did some research in my egg donation program and saw that it's real. It's called epigenetics. So all those bad things I was talking about, they influence how the DNA works through what's called epigenetics. And so I tell my male part, my male patients, hey guys, you gotta kick in here. Take those vitamins, behave yourself. Don't take testosterone, by the way. That's that's a killer, right? Um, and then like, you got a little, very little to do compared to your, your partner, you know, if you're in a heterosexual couple, um, but that's all we can do today. And I do think it's a real miss in our field, a real oversight. I do. I agree. Um, I love that guys behave yourself, please. 
Um, so, you know, there's so many celebrities out there and I can think of so many names, you know, women over 40 who've had babies and they've made it so hard on us as doctors because they mislead our patients so often. Um, so what are some of the options? I mean, not to speak about what they've done, but what are some of the options that a woman who's for, you know, over 40 should be considering when it comes time to conceiving? Yeah. Well, you know, to, to further your, your, your observation about celebrities and those in the public eye. Um, I think the idea is if you're rich and famous, you know, the special doctors, maybe, you know, the Dr. Amy's of the world who can get you pregnant, right? Unfortunately, uh, the, the ovaries of celebrities <laughs> don't know how special they are. Um, the statistic is still true. If you're 45 years old, your eggs are prone to that mistake I talked about. They're prone to poor egg quality. And the chance that you're going to have a baby from your eggs is really, really low, no matter how famous you are. Um, now, of course, some say, not just celebrities, others that I froze my eggs when I was younger or I made embryos when I was younger. Yeah, okay, then that does does happen. It doesn't happen that much, but it does happen. Um, and that, you know, one more point that when I've asked this, been asked this before, they're, I think they're just trying to protect their baby, right? It's they're the mother and they want to tell the child at the right time that they came from an egg donor. So I do get that. But you're absolutely right. The It is misinformation, or at least it's inferred as misinformation. So women over 40, it's important to realize that there's a there's unfortunately a time window. And if you're not pregnant with, if you're a heterosexual couple, and you're not pregnant within six months, you got to get a workup, make sure you're not missing something like the sperm, for example, uh, is bad. Um and then the goal of treatment is get more eggs on a given month so you can find the normal or the good quality egg and have a baby. So you either take shots to make multiple eggs and do artificial insemination, or you take shots to make a bunch of eggs and then do in vitro fertilization. But all roads kind of lead to increasing the odds. And that's what's important as soon as you can after 40. Are you on Twitter? No. So I do the thing, it's called a quote of the day. And I think, do I have your permission? I'm going to actually quote you. The ovaries of celebrities don't know how special they are. <laughs> I think that's a really good one to like, you know, make the point that, um, you know, it's just, you know, the 50 year old who's having a baby um, and makes it look so easy and she's a celebrity, she's still a 50 year old. And so that, that's hard. For, for me to see. Because patients literally come to me, they're like, Dr. Amy, I know you're an amazing doctor. I want what she had. And I know if any doctor can do it for me, it's you. And I'm like, you're 50 years old. I'm going to, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Jane. <laughs> okay. Um, and you do, you know, what, your work is great. And, and, you know, talking more about your work as far as egg donation, how does it work? You know, it's a hard decision for women. You're giving up your eggs, right? So I always, tell women and patients, um, you have to try with your eggs as far as you can or as much as you need to. That's your journey. Only you can define when you're ready to move on. Sometimes someone needs to be told it's time, right? But it's a hard decision. I also tell my patients um, when they tell me, oh, I'm ready for egg donation. I said, well, actually, you're not ready for it. You can't be ready. But intellectually, um, you're ready. I get that. Because you want to be a, you want to give birth and you want to be a parent, and that's okay. And I, I find that that's an important partnership that way. Um, so when it comes to choosing a donor, um, these are women in their twenties, and in my egg bank, we've done all the homework as of other egg banks. That's the genetic screen, the medical screen, the psychological screen, the reliability, all those things. And with egg banking, it's even better because the eggs are already in the bank. So the patient and her partner just need to focus on what they like. And they have some choice because they're giving things up too, right? So they get some choice here. Uh, it might be the ethnic background. It might be height, eye color, uh, athleticism, academic prowess, whatever it might be. But they have a choice on that. But all other things being equal, that's what they look for. Sometimes they look for a donor that's um, maybe unproven or already had babies from egg donation, although first-time donors work just as well. But that's really the process is getting – the emotional and psychological um, readiness for it, and then picking the donor they want. And then when they pick a donor, uh, they pick a number of eggs based on their goals because we can correlate the number of eggs to the number of blastocyst embryos. Those are five-day-old embryos that are made from the eggs. So from eight eggs, we normally get three blastocyst embryos, which we freeze, by the way. Uh, and then every time we transfer one of those embryos, um, our success rates are about 65 to 70% baby rate. 
nationally it's about 50 percent um and so if it doesn't work the first time they get a second transfer 90 percent of people have a baby so that's that's how it works for us and then if they want to see the sex of the baby that can also be done a variety of things like that but that's sort of the big picture of it, is the readiness the selection of the donor the selection of number of eggs build their family no i love that that's very easy to understand and i i have to tell people not that you know i i want people to think that these results will be seen everywhere but for any patient that i've referred to you or any you, that you've taken care of over the years i think we're at 100 percent. every transfer has led to a healthy pregnancy and baby and i just think that shows the quality of the work that you do there so thank you for that um, and what about surrogacy? You talked about how you really feel, you know, your clinic is doing third party parenting, like the whole, you know, from egg to baby, and you now have incorporated surrogacy. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So we have gestational surrogates, you know, the old, the, the other type of surrogacy, traditional surrogacy, where the surrogate provides egg. We don't do that, nor does really many people do that. Um, surrogates are women under 40, healthy, have their, have their own children, no obstetric problems or pregnancy problems or healthy with um, no medical problems. Um, they're hard to find. Um, there's a real shortage in the country. Some of the big agencies have a year backup. Um, we have our own surrogates. They're for our patients and from for close friends and close doctors that we know, uh, present company included. <laughs> um, um, and we pre-screen our surrogates, so they're ready to go. Um, and basically, uh, women who cannot carry the pregnancy because it's a, it poses a risk to their life, for example, if they have medical problems or a risk to the child's life are candidates for surrogacy. Um, as are women who've tried fertility treatments that, that haven't worked. Um, and, and the surrogate does not have a genetic link to the child. That's the egg and sperm provider. Um, they do, however, uh, nourish the child, nourish the fetus. And so it does matter that they're healthy and live a healthy life during pregnancy. But at the end of the day, um, they're disconnected genetically. California's not always at the greatest rules because at 21 or 22 weeks, the hospital gets a court order saying, hey, when that baby's delivered, it belongs to these people, <laughs> the parents, and they're, on, they're the only ones on the birth certificate. Now other states have really favorable laws. And so getting an out-of-state California surrogate is, is not a bad thing, especially in these virtual days where people can follow pregnancies virtually. Yeah, and what about for gay men? How does it work for them? Yeah, you know, we're actually um, have a lot of gay clients because we're kind of built for their needs. Uh, gay guys have the sperm. Oftentimes you have two sources of sperm, um, but we have the eggs and we have the surrogate um, and we have the medical care. Um, and so, you know, just like any other couple or single person, they pick the eggs and uh, we create the embryos and the surrogate carries it for them. Um, we also work with HIV positive men who are um, uh, undetectable with the virus that's been shown without question to, to be a non-transmissible state. And so we really pride ourselves in being uh, a full service package to that community um, who, you know, are, who encountered bias and prejudice and, and a lot of un understandable anxiety in going through all these steps. So um, we have an integrated program that we work with them uh, frequently on. Yeah. And patients have so many options out there when it comes to egg banks now more than ever. If you were someone who, you know, was looking through options, what kind of things should a patient be looking for when picking an egg bank? Yeah, you know, um, for us, uh, we only take 2% of the donor applicants and we pre-screen everything. We have to really believe in the donor and her reliability and her genetic and medical history. Um, and then we know all the donors, we met them. They, we did, I did the, the care of the donors and so when we speak to our intended parent uh, candidates, um, we speak from a point of an in-house program. Um, some of the larger banks don't have that. They bank the donors' eggs one place and ship to many different places. Now, I'm not, I don't think that's a negative per se because someone was going to get healthy eggs and the, at the cost might be affordable and they might be in a small town in a, in a smaller state and that's just all they have. So that's great. They have a family. That's That's all good. But uh, the experience is important and the trust is important. We also build in the, the plan to have backup embryos as part of what we do. And we almost universally always have extra embryos so that we can, we can do another transfer if the first one doesn't work. We do it for no cost. And that's how you get that high level, right? Because the first one might be 65, 70%, by the second you're up to 90%.
patients also get nervous if they only have one embryo. Um, it's just so so I spent a lot of time when I built the program in thinking about the anxiousness and the patient experience and how does someone feel better and more confident. And these are some of the factors that are built into it, the experience. Is there anything else you want to add and share with our followers today? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's something you also uh, profess, and that's good information, right? You know, there's so much misinformation out there, whether it's a lay public or it's medical doctors. I think patients just have to ask questions and and not become almost victims of the information. Yes, your friend may have taken, um, you know, CoQ10 and she got pregnant. It doesn't mean that's the case. So you may not need to cut out sugar and alcohol and and um, and caffeine. You may not need to have a restricted diet. Pick and choose what feels good for you, realizing that nothing's going to change the egg. It's just un- unfortunate, but it might change how you feel. And then on the other side, with doctors, I think I, I so frequently see patients who really didn't know what they did. And I, I find that kind of appalling because it's it's not helpful, really. Yeah? And it doesn't feel good. So I encourage patients, just ask the questions. You know, Why are we doing this? How is it going to really change the management? How is this going to help me have a baby? Uh, and I, so I think the number one me- message I have is just be informed, ask the questions, both uh, both in the lay public and otherwise. Exactly. Who's my doctor going to be that day? You know, there. You know, you and I are unique in that we are. Like I joke and I say, there's three people that work here: me, myself, and I. You're going to get one of us. <laughs> yeah. So if one of us isn't here, you're going to get the other one. Um, so that's nice. So how can people find you in your clinic? Well, it's easy. It's just SantaMonicaFertility.com. And it has a link to our egg bank and has a link to our surrogacy agency. And uh, we are people that pick up the phone here. Not, not to say that uh, automated systems don't work, but that's what we do. <laughs> so yeah. give us a call, uh, send an email, get a contact sheet, and i um, happy to talk to them. And who doesn't love going to Santa Monica? That's right. It's a wonderful place. A wonderful place. <laughs> well, thank you, John. Thank you for making my patients parents. Thank you for all the work that you're doing, pushing our field forward. And I really appreciate you. Oh, thank you for today. And thanks for the trust in the program. It's been great working with you, Amy. All right. Thanks for today, too. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadine. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 